Topics. An option by uh, Seth Rogen and Evan Goldberg. It's going to be really awesome. So we're really thankful that you guys have taken time out of your day to come here. We think it's going to be a great panel. If you haven't had a chance to read the book yet, it's going to be for sale in the sales pavilion after the show. Uh, you can get it signed by both Blake and the lovely Tom Kalinske. We're going to be at um, AA09 right in the sales pavilion, so you'll be able to buy books right there. So now I'm going to turn it over to our wonderful panel, and then after about 20 minutes, we're going to open up to you guys for questions. So take it away, Blake. All right. Well, the real stars of the show here are the uh, people who were in the trenches and saying at Nintendo to my right and to my left. But I'll just briefly tell you how I got involved with this project and how it has been the best three years of my life. Um, so about three and a half years ago, my brother got me a Sega Genesis for my birthday, which is what we had when we were kids. And I picked up that uh, moon-shaped controller, and it brought back all sorts of memories. And after playing it for a few hours, um, you know, after this barrage of nostalgia hit me, I started to have all these questions about where did Sega come from, what happened to Sega, what was going on behind the scenes that made them such a successful company and uh, helped them with their underdog narrative against Nintendo, and then eventually they sort of uh, disappeared, or at least got out of the console business. And so, at first I really just wanted to read a book about the behind the scenes of what was going on with these two great companies, um, and when no such book existed, I decided to step in and uh, see if there was a story to tell. And the story that I ended up finding was so much more fun and exciting than I ever could have imagined, and that is because of these dynamic personalities at the companies. Um, and you know, to a large extent, Sega and Nintendo shaped my childhood, so these are the people that really did shape my childhood. Um, and because it is such a character-driven story that makes it so exciting, I thought we would begin by talking and um, hearing from everyone about how they ended up at Sega or Nintendo. Why don't we start with Mr. Al Nelson. Why don't you introduce yourself and uh, tell us how your story began. Hi, Al Nelson, and I was basically the person who launched Genesis back in 1989. <laughs> Sega and Genesis and Sonic, you know, 25 years later. By the way, August 14th, I want everybody to party. It's going to be the 25th anniversary of the launch of Sega Genesis. So, you know, go and have a cake, have a cupcake, have a drink, <laughs> post it on Instagram, Instagram, social media, follow me on Twitter, send it to me. I want to see how you're celebrating because it's been a fabulous 25 years. And, you know, we all remember Sega and Nintendo as these two strong titans battling it out, but when you first got there in 1989, what was the marketplace like for Sega and the Genesis? 95% uh, to 5%. And the Sega Master System, you know, you didn't play video games, you played Nintendo. And that's what it was up. And we were coming out with the 16-bit system. But what everybody or what most people forget was there was another player in the marketplace, and that was NEC. And the retailers were really excited about NEC. And I remember one retailer goes, oh, they've got these great videos and these beautiful brochures. You know, we'll carry your product, but we're going to, it's not going to sell, and we're going to return everything the day after Christmas. <laughs> well, the day after Christmas, we got returned? NEC. And that was really the start. And we weren't focused on Nintendo, we were focused on NEC. And then once 1990 came, it was time to go and change our focus on the Nintendo Entertainment System. You know, and probably the, the, the best thing, story I could tell is how many Sonic lovers out there? Yeah. Can you imagine the world without Sonic? <laughs> Almost happened. One day, Shinobu Toyota, our executive vice president, walked into my office, closed the door, it was really strange for him to do so, and said, Sega's been working on a mascot, they have two that they are happy with, you got to decide which one it is. And there was one which was egg-shaped, it's kind of like weevils wobble, but they don't fall down. And I could understand why it would work in Japan, but in the U.S. it looked very preschool. And then there was a hedgehog. What's a hedgehog? And it's spikes, and he's got a human girlfriend named Madonna, and he's got a rock band. I kid you not, I chose Sonic because it was the lesser of two weevils. <laughs> Of it until you know months later when I was in Japan and I saw the early first play black and white, no screens, and here was this thing that was just moving faster than anything else. 
then moved on to another dev system and saw these beautiful backgrounds. And it's like, can you really put them together? And it was like, yeah. And I just came back and started telling everybody at SOA about this. And Paul Rio still raves about it. Alan Wilson was going crazy about this product that he saw in Japan. And that was the whole start of Sonic. But and so, I got it. So, you know, you guys knew that you had this great game. Um, but for Sega, you were really competing against the tech that you wanted to create an iconic Mario-like character. And to do that, you wanted to create a backstory, sort of like, you know, a movie. And you brought in the perfect guy to do that, Tom Clinton, who throughout the previous decades, I soon didn't realize that other than my parents, Tom Clinton was the adult most responsible for my childhood. Um, from his experiences at Mattel and Matchbox and J. Walter Thompson, why don't you tell us a little bit about some of your experiences creating these iconic brands before Sega and, and what it was like when you stepped in? Okay. So, uh, <laughs> gee, that was a surprise. <laughs> so, I, I have been in the kids' business most of my uh, life. And Business or teenage business with Sega and, and later education businesses. But I started with Flintstones Vitamins. I went on the team and created Flintstones Vitamins and sold them to Miles Laboratories and built up to be the number one kids for Vitamin in six months. And then I went to uh, Mattel and I was on the preschool business building the CNC and the putt putts and the tough stuff and what have you. And one day Ruth Hamilton walked into my, the founder of Mattel walked into my cubicle. And, which was near the men's room, so I had a lot of people stop by. And she, she said, uh, Tom, last year Barbie declined in sales, and the sales force says it's over for Barbie, and the retailers say it's over for Barbie, and uh, the bankers say it's over for Barbie. What do you think about that? And I said, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Ruth. Barbie will be around long after you and I are gone. And she said, that's what I want to hear. You're not the marketing director at Barbie. Wow. So, <laughs> so uh, we repositioned Barbie as we well, kind of looked like Ken. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> With Barbie, you could be whatever you want to be, and they're still using that, that positioning today. And there's President Barbie, and Engineer Barbie, and Teacher Barbie, and what have you. Uh, but anyway, there were a lot of other things I did there, and the Pop Wars business, and the Masters of the Universe business. He made, you can see, he made looks exactly like him. <laughs> <laughs> but you were responsible for his podcast. I was, and I was responsible for the TV show, the He Man Masters of the Universe television show. And uh, uh, then I went and, and built the Matchbox business. Matchbox was a receivership in the UK, which means it was a bankrupt, and we turned it around and sold it. And, uh, and then I basically, was, was, as you wrote in the story, I was lying on the beach in Hawaii with my wife and then two kids. And, and this fellow I knew from years ago at Mattel tracked me down, not high on the island, and, and said, uh, You've got to come back to Japan with me. And I said, Why? Well, president of Sega. Uh, why would I want to do that? And he said, well, because we need you to take on uh, the video game business and take on Nintendo, who has a 95% share of the market, and we've got this great 16-bit machine that's better than anything you've ever seen. We also have a color handheld. And so I flew from Hawaii to Tokyo, and I fell in love with the Genesis system and with the Game Gear, what became the Game Gear system, <laughs> and uh, uh, met up with somebody I'd known from Past, Al Nielsen, and Paul Rio, used to, who was our chief, chief uh, operating officer and worked with me at Mattel. They met this great guy, Shinobu Toyota, and uh, we took on the giant company Nintendo by uh, doing a lot of different things. First, the, the, the strategy really was four different parts of it. Let's put the best game we have in the Genesis system as opposed to having Altered Beast in there. Take Altered Beast out, or actually we added some. And, and lower the price of the hardware with Sonic in it, and take on uh, more do more sports games for a teenage and older audience, and more role playing and strategy games for an older audience, and, and also uh, license American characters. And then um, let's make fun of Nintendo and advertising, <laughs> <laughs> which we really enjoyed doing. <laughs> and of course, when I presented this in Japan to the board, Everybody stood up and said, uh, they started talking in Japan, in Japanese, and I didn't understand what they were saying, but basically it was, this guy's crazy, let's get him out of here. <laughs> and, uh, uh, Shinobu wouldn't translate that part to me, he always said, oh, we're just discussing it. <laughs> at, the end of the, at the end of the board meeting, Hayao Nakayama, the CEO, stood up as he was walking out, and I thought, oh, that's the end of my career. 
And he said, nobody agrees with anything you said. We don't agree with lowering the price. And if we put Sonic in with the hardware, we lose a profitable software sale. So that's crazy. And then if you lower the price, you lose even more money on the hardware. And if you, we allow you to do more games in the United States, particularly sports games, American licenses, you've got to build up staff, there's, that's going to cost more money. And then you want to take on this, our competitor in, in advertising. That's nobody does that. And he said, but I hired you and told you that I would let you make your decisions, so go ahead and do all those things. So he did, and that's when the fun began. And so before the fun began, you guys did take on Nintendo, and it's easy to position them, you know, as sort of the Goliath, and David and Goliath story. Um, but it really was a story of two companies with different philosophies, and even five years before Sega really came on the scene with the Genesis, Nintendo had their own David and Goliath struggle to resurrect the video game industry after the crash of Atari. Um, and Billy, you were one of the early employees in Nintendo. Why don't you talk a little bit about why you chose to join the company and some of those early struggles before you guys had 95% of this market that people thought was over? Sure. Well, I knew I had made the right decision to work for Peter Main at Nintendo when my real estate broker told me they had two small children. <laughs> Hey, they're, they're doing nothing but playing in front of the television set. They said, well, what are they doing? They said, they're playing Nintendo. I have never heard of Nintendo. And uh, it became very obvious to me that I'd walked into a very good thing in 1987, becoming a, a, one of the marketing team at Nintendo. And uh, the beauty of it all was it was so simple. I mean, here we had a, a CEO, Minoru Arakawa, who had been selling condominiums in Vancouver, was the son-in-law of the chairman of this Nintendo company in Kyoto, Japan. Um, Peter Main, who was a VP of marketing and had run restaurants in Canada, and uh, an attorney who had been with a major law firm in Seattle. These three people were trying to resurrect the video game business. And, you know, the good news is the, the entertainment value of video games never went away with Atari. Atari screwed Atari. And uh, the fact that the retailers got so burned so quickly uh, at the end of the Atari era basically shied everyone away from trying the thing again in the United States. And thank goodness that Nintendo had the wherewithal coming from these little handheld games to uh, resurrect the industry as they did. And, you know, history has proven that you know, games sell hardware, and that's been the philosophy from Nintendo in the beginning. And that's why basically all we did was advertise titles. And uh, most of our titles came from wonderful creative people in Japan. And I was one of those people that was struggling from the inside, saying we've got to bring some American themes and American talent to the, to the party. But uh, I was proven wrong time and time again by just selling great titles that drove great hardware, including Game Boy. So. And one of those great titles um, was Super Mario Bros. 3, which, you know, back then, <laughs> We didn't always know what was coming next. As kids, it was almost like these things appeared out of thin air. Um, but one thing, but Super Mario Bros. 3 was an exception because there was the movie The Wizard, where it was sort of the first time that there was a teaser, um, and Bill was, you know, the point person in putting together that movie and working as the, work the liaison uh, between the studio and Nintendo. I think it's one of the greatest movies of all time, so why don't you tell us a little bit about <laughs> how, uh, how that deal happened and the problems? Yes. Uh, interesting, I went down to the big black tower in uh, Universal Studios and, uh, and it was like a dream of mine to be there because I'd grown up in Los Angeles but had never been associated with the film industry per se. And we were there to uh, sell the rights to Mario for a film and uh, I was told to get $100,000 or don't go, you know, don't sell. And so I was there with Al Khan who was in charge of our licensing. Uh, Al's a, a wonderful character was a liaison with the executives there. And we walked away with this, this uh, film idea that uh, was a natural vehicle for us to not only increase the brand awareness and popularity of Nintendo, but also to help launch a new game. And uh, I had nothing to do with the creative content of the film other than to make sure that the Nintendo characters, the Nintendo games were, were true. And there wasn't any obscenity in the game, so I can't think they looked better than that. Um, great film, everyone should go. I love it. My kids love it. Um, and so, you know, Perry, you joined uh, Nintendo America a few years after that, and this was after sort of Sega had started to make their search. What was the environment like for you coming in at a time where Nintendo still the dominant video game player, but there was finally competition on the horizon? And, 
where we all stay in touch and we have a very special feeling about one another. And it was this great atmosphere where somebody would have an idea and we would just say, well, let's, how can we make it better than that? How can we make this bigger? And of course, some things like the idea of going after a teenage audience and advertising, you might think, well, what's so big about that? Well, Nintendo was advertising mainly to young parents or children. We went out directly after teens, so we were going to MTV, we were going to rock concerts and, and setting up uh, machines outside of rock concerts. We were doing grassroots marketing anywhere that teens and college age kids gathered. We had a, a college uh, game player on virtually every campus that we paid and gave game, game card consoles to and games to to get them to talk about Sega among their community. So we did an awful lot of things that were that were just different. And of course we also did, as you all know, we did games that were older in nature. And that's why we created the rating system. But eventually the whole industry basically had to, uh, had to, had to adopt. So we did a lot of unique things that helped uh, the industry change from being, when I joined the industry was a maybe $3 billion industry. Today it's a $63 billion industry. And I do think a lot of things that this small team that Sega started, helped create this giant industry that's $63 billion today. And we're at about the halfway point, so while Karen and Bill tell us about the day-to-day -day Nintendo, if any of you have questions for the folks, you can start taking a line right at the uh, microphone at the center. So, okay, Karen and Bill. So, you know, uh, that was sort of what was going on in the Sega perspective. What was it like for Nintendo? Did you, you know, like, that was what was going on from your point of view? Well, yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> They probably brought uh, broke a lot of new ground. We, uh, we were able to bring consumer packaged goods marketing skills to the video game business. And that included, you know, uh, Happy Meals with uh, Mario Bros. for the first time. We did a, uh, I don't know if anybody remembers the, the Nintendo shows that went around the country. You could come and play all the new games and people paid 10 or 15 dollars. So World championships. World championships yeah. all around the country. Um, we did the first college tour. We went to 50 different colleges across the country. But the beauty of it was, for me, coming from packaged goods marketing myself, where I was trying to distinguish between toilet paper A and toilet paper B and sell more, is that the uh, quality of the games, the quality of the product I had to sell at Nintendo was so bad that it really sold itself. Arakawa, I, I would come and say, look, we've got to do this big market research study between software A, B, C, and D. And he said, no, Bill. We already had it in the wall up in Kent, Washington for three weeks, and product C outsells product A by three to one. And that's how he would make his decision on which software title to support for millions of dollars of advertising. And I thought, well, gee, you know, that's the wrong sample. Kent, Washington doesn't represent the United States. We could make a big error here, and by golly, he was right every time. Because the product sold, the, the, this, the wonderful play of the product came through to everybody who played it, and it was obvious it was there or it wasn't there. And sometimes I try and sell stuff that wasn't there because we had a lot of inventory, in it, but it doesn't work that way. A lot of advertising's out there to sell product that isn't as good as it could be or should be relative to the competition. But um, it was a wonderful time to be in the industry. I'm glad I had a part. And Perry, from your point of view, what were you seeing that Sam was doing that was working and also not working, whether it was short? Well, I think what they did that was right was subtly, I don't want to use the word copy, but conceptually copy, copy. <laughs> um, the, the, the fun component of what Nintendo brought, there was nothing else in the world like it, and so then here comes this company, while we're busy doing our business, that created something that was as fun, or more fun for some people, and then people started to want to have both systems or they started to be aligned with one character or another. So Sega did a really good job of bringing that same love, but to a different company. Um, I had the, the luxury and greatness and wonderful career at Nintendo to be strategic and look for places where we could, you know, poke holes and do a variety of other strategic things behind the scenes. So that was a lot of fun. Um, we did some things that in hindsight were strategic and probably didn't make Sega very happy. The one thing we didn't do is we had planned a huge dump truck um, of videos we were going to dump in your parking lot. <laughs> <laughs> After we launched Donkey Kong, yeah. and we decided not to do that because of the 
you know, mess up with us, and that's what we actually debated was it was a waste of food. We don't want to have to answer that. That kind of personifies it, just between saying and Nintendo. You know, that would have been a great publicity story to do this yeah. contract with Nintendo, but you guys decided that the sign would have been cool and kind of an idea. It's better to focus on this as usual, focus on the game. Yeah, and here's the, here's the message from Nintendo, and, um, and what I learned, and I, I think it's a great thing for everybody to learn and take with them in their life no matter what they do. You stick to the art of what you are known for, and you do that better than anybody else who will always have success. So you stick to whatever makes you unique or you unique or you unique, and you just stick with it and ignore others in terms of, boy, I should be doing that over there. Nintendo was poked and nudged and, and awakened, and then went back to its business of focusing on what it does best. And I, I think there's still so much of that that's alive today. Um, and companies do change over the course of time, but that same joy and love for Nintendo products and Nintendo characters, I don't see diminishing anytime soon. Um, Great, yeah. so let's get, let's get to our questions. We've got a bunch of people with a bunch of questions. So first up, Hi there. Um, I just wanted to come up here and quickly say that um, I'm a, I'm actually now working at Naughty Dog, and because of um, my childhood and because of the distinct decision of packaging Sonic the Hedgehog 2 in with the Sega Genesis, that pretty much solidified my future as a video game, as being part of the video game industry. So I just wanted to come over and say thank you so much for me, for sending that. Thank you. Um, well, just based upon your professional experience and you know what you see the market is going now, um, how do you think that the I guess the company's direction is currently going? Like, do you think that they're doing a great job? Because I mean, I guess. The question is, you know, a lot of people have been talking about how Nintendo and Sega have kind of gone through the back based upon how Sony and Microsoft is basically taking over hardcore gaming. But just, you know, in general, like, what do you think? So your question is to, to about Nintendo. Right? Yeah, yeah, Nintendo, and I guess Sega as well. Yeah, and of course I'm no longer there, but there's a, you know, a big yeah. piece of my heart that will remain with that brand, and I think that. Um, it's really easy for people to go negative before they go positive. So you have to understand if people are making comments, those who have something positive to say it just aren't always going to be included. Uh, the thing that I think is a bit of a misnomer, and you can agree or not agree, but, but Microsoft and Sony are very similar. Nintendo is and always will be something uniquely different. And when people line them up as, as if it's a three-horse race, I think it's a misnomer. Nintendo will always be true to itself, no matter what software or hardware it brings out, and will always um, have the same kind of fun in their games and do it at the just to just to continue down its own personality, its own world. And a lot of people are saying, well, they should do this or they should put the games on apps, you know, blah blah blah. That just makes sense. And there's so much about Nintendo that, um, and, I, and I don't work for them and I can't speak for them anymore, but they have a lot of precious things and continuing on the road of doing what they do best makes them, in my opinion, very different than Sony and Microsoft. A few strongholds, including the UK, so the Master System outsold the NES by a mile, for example. So <laughs> I got to see the battle from a whole different perspective. Uh, so it's always been interesting reading how it was completely different in America over the years. Uh, my question is, uh, gaming is changing. Uh, different devices are coming in, phones, pads, everything like that, that are competing for core gaming markets now. But the one thing that's continued on for 25 years now is Nintendo's handheld systems. It survived the Game Gear, it survived the Lynx, it survived the Neo Geo Pocket Color. Arguably Sony's Vita is completely dead now. What do you think Nintendo's handheld <laughs> systems offer that continue their stronghold effectively and offer against the competition from new devices such as iPhones and iPads in, in that market? Again, this is just my personal point of view, but I feel fairly strongly about it. I think that um, snack gaming 
on the smartphones is just really fun and has a great purpose if you're at the airport, you're waiting for somebody, you're on the phone, you're bored to death with conversation, or whatever it is. But I also think those are things you download and you delete later when you're done having a life with them. Having a dedicated system that provides you a really rich experience that is singular that way and that you can you know, enjoy with your friends, it's, it's like a magazine versus a, a richer novel. And I think they both have places in people's lives, and I personally do not think one has anything to do with the other. Thank you. A couple of questions. Were you, uh, when you were around with the uh, late 90s when the emulator scene started coming up and people could actually play like NES and Genesis games on their PCs, like, did you guys ever notice that or anything? Nintendo's brand is so strong and held so close to the people within the company with such great pride. And the one thing that Nintendo will always stand for is quality, pure ethic. And anything that would disrupt the quality of the name, the brand, the experience was over the legal line. So, and related are definitely in that category. Hi. Uh, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about uh, the development of the Super Nintendo after the Genesis came out. Um, particularly, it, it seemed like there was a lot of focus on, on the really excellent sound, which, which I think was the sound chip, I think, was created by Sony. Um, well, I think that, you know, as you guys were involved in the technical creation of it, uh, but why don't you talk about what it was like? I mean, you had this thing that was in one in three homes in America. There was over 30 million NES systems. It was the most popular toy or consumer electronic product at the time, and then Sega comes in with a more powerful one. What was it like to transition to another great product, but know that there was a chance you might be abandoning your demographic? So what's the, I, I missed your question. Oh, I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you guys decided on the development of Super Nintendo, trying to, you know, basically trying to build a system to compete with the Genesis. Well, I think Barry will probably have something to say about this. I, I um, felt that we should abandon the 8-bit system and move to the Super Nintendo uh, much faster. Uh, management at Nintendo felt that there were a lot more legs on the, on the NES, uh, a lot more homes to, to sell to. Um, I guess that in itself is a um, fact and it opened the door for the Genesis. Um, but certainly the Super Nintendo is a great product. It could have been launched earlier, yes, it wasn't, but it still had tremendous success in the market. I think simply anything that, is, it, that works out and is amazing and that consumers love, um, the next iteration is just an evolutionary thing. So of course it's going to be more powerful um, and bring different kinds of games with a lot of the same beloved characters. So I think it was just the evolutionary next step. And, and aren't we glad that all this happened? Because here we are. Yeah. We were very happy with the lunch time. I just want to say you guys were an inspiration to me as well. I'm actually a contributor to Retro Magazine and a full-time game journal now. So I thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. Uh, my question is, uh, how often did you partake in your own product? I mean, like, did you guys play like games all the time? And get kind of addicted to certain titles like Mario Kart or pairing like Wii Music or anything like that? Just was curious about that. We, we, we were all players, and you know, it's, as they say today, we were eating our own dog food. And you know, it's we love to play. We played our games. We played our third-party games. I played Nintendo games. Oh, yes, we did. We played it. You know, we wanted to know what was out there, and we had fun. <laughs> we love to play, and I think that was part of you know the specialness here was we all just love to play games. We were very happy when SNES came out. And we played the first game. We thought it was just perfect for us. <laughs> and what about you guys play a lot of games in the office? You know, to be part of a large Nintendo family is no different than being a, a consumer or customer. But it's you know. You eat it, you breathe it, you sleep with it, and it becomes part of you, so absolutely, yes. Same here, I had two wonderful children that basically were my game testers 24 hours a day. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Hi, uh, I think we saw a number of things contribute to 
the crash uh, regarding home video systems. Um, we had Atari with the way that they treated their employees, and consequently, the game suffered. We also had the techno technological abilities compared to what was in the arcade versus home systems. Nintendo takes a huge gamble and releases the NES. Obviously, with, with Sega as well, you have uh, advancements with the technology. You have both companies treating their employees a lot better. Consequently, you're getting better quality of your games. And then the biggest branding icons, you know, two that I can't think of really any other two icons in the past 50 years that have been as big as, you know, Sega and Nintendo. Do you think there was one contributing factor to where that gamble paid off between all of those? Why, 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 the advancement yes. technology or the, the branding um, or the better treatment of the employees. That are so why did why it work? Yeah. Do you think one, one played more of a role than any of the others? No. I'll personally throw this into the, the ring and I think that it's the quality of the software that was maintained vis-a-vis -vis the uh, proprietary Nintendo partners. Yes. I mean, me and is the first thing that comes to mind. I, I don't know if Tom will agree with me on that. I mean, I think essentially that allowed the industry to get off the ground without worry of uh, crappy software kind of ruining the whole thing. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. I mean, I think we tried very, very hard to make sure we had 50, 60, 70, 100 hours of play in every product we, we brought out. And uh, when you have great games, uh, the, the industry obviously grew. And, you know, when we were in the industry, the average age was 15 or something. Today, the average age, according to Sony, is 32. So that's quite a change. You know, one of the uh, personifications of that previous era and why it failed was the ET game, which was rushed, um, terrible. And you know, one thing that was struck me about um, Al Nelson was he had a, a reminder of this. And what was that reminder? <laughs> I had a framed ET cartridge on my wall, and on the front of the cartridge was five price stickers from $49.95 to $1.99 or down. And I got it for half price, I got it for 99 cents. <laughs> I kept it there just to remind me not to make crap. <laughs> I borrowed this line from Peter Main, and I'm happy to say that's the best thing I ever stole from Nintendo, and it was the name of the game is the game. And that's what it was all about. And we delivered great games, but then we had really cool and edgy marketing to help you get even more excited about the so I think we start with the game and then add some great marketing on top of that. Right, we have two minutes left, so last question. I'm sorry, guys, but I hope it's a good one. Um, <laughs> first of all, it would have been known as a Sega, uh, Sega PlayStation. It would have probably been known as the Sega Dreamcast 3. Yeah. And uh, speaking of Dreamcast, I'll tell you your opinion of it, because to me, it's one of the most underappreciated consoles yeah. to me. Sega, the Nintendo Japan, Nintendo America, 
American companies seem to be able to have the same common vision, the same common goals, and to fulfill them better than I looking back at history now, looking back at Sega after I left, that Sega was able to do. So I think that was the big difference. And on that note, we are out of time, but can we have a round of applause for our one I gotta go to the restroom. And that's a wrap.